you know, we're uh, excited about the football team that we have um, going into the season. You know, every, every year is a new team, and certainly we lost some great playmakers last year. Um, but again, you know, every team across the country has lost great playmakers. And probably some of the similarities are, you know, USC and LSU lost um, Heisman Trophy winners at, at quarterback. And so now it's time to talk about the guys that we do have. And, you know, we're excited about, you know, some of the leadership that we have. Um, as many of you know, um, recent news, uh, Josh Williams and Greg Penn were awarded the number 18. They exemplify, um, you know, the kind of um, other-centeredness, uh, thinking about team first. Uh, that's that's uh, emblematic of 18, being a great teammate, overcoming adversity. And number seven um, will be uh, worn by Will Campbell. Of course, he's an offensive lineman. He can't actually wear seven, but he'll have a patch um, that will uh, – uh, show that, and then Harold Perkins uh, on defense. And, and again, what does seven represent to us? A, a great history and tradition uh, with both of these numbers, 18 and seven. And seven, much more about um, uh, a, a player that uh, has the immaturity to take the lead and to bring up the play uh, of all those past seasons, certainly individually as a great player, but, but is more than that. Uh, somebody that, uh, again, from, from my perspective, um, can uh, electrify all those around him, and both of these guys certainly do that. So um, I wanted to make sure that we, we gave uh, proper notice uh, to those guys. From an injury standpoint, um, you know, we have uh, one guy that is um, questionable, and that's uh, – Chris Hilton, uh, he has a uh, bone bruise. Uh, he is uh, working through that process, but today he'll be listed um, in, in that category. Um, probable is, um, it would, be, um, would be Frazier, uh, our offensive guard. Uh, those are the two uh, right now that would show up on our, our injury report um, relative to this week. Um, Looking again um, at, at some of the, the things that we need to do against a, a great team like this, you know, certainly it's been a prolific offense. Um, Lincoln Riley is an outstanding football coach. You know, his pedigree in terms of winning at, at Oklahoma and again at USC has been through the offense. Um, and, you know, we've got to do a great job, obviously, in, in making them, um, you know, one dimensional. Um, you know, they, they are, if they are balanced offensively, they are very difficult to defend. Um, we've got to limit some of the big plays. Uh, certainly, uh, Zachariah Branch is an electrifying offensive player. We've got to be able to tackle him, not only offensively, but in special teams. And then obviously prepare for a defense that we're not really certain about uh, because they have so many uh, new players on defense. You know, we know the structure. Um, you know, we know that, um, you know, from a defensive standpoint, they bring in a lot of talented players. Um, you know, Bear Alexander, uh, Ramsey, you know, a lot of these guys are coming in um, as, as heralded transfers uh, that, that certainly will impact their defense. Um, Coach Lynn coming over from UCLA did a great job, and, and, and he will impact that defense as well. So, um, you know, we've got our hands full, but, you know, again, from our perspective, you know, we'll, we'll be who we are from an offensive standpoint. Um, you know, try to be as balanced as we can on offense. Um, you know, defensively, we've got to be able to, as I mentioned, um, tackle in space, do a great job of, of stopping the run and, and prevent some of the big plays. A lot of kind of the, the same things that, that you hear week in and week in, when, week in and week out when, when coaches talk about um, – you know, what they need to do to win football games. So that's a little bit about LSU and um, USC uh, and Sunday. Uh, I'll open it up to questions. Hey, Brian, right up the middle. Just uh, what are some of the hallmarks of a Lincoln Riley offense? And, and you, you touched on it a little bit, but how do they stress you? And then um, later we're going to go see your recovery center. 
why was that so important to you to, to have implemented? Yeah, so, you know, first of all, you know, from an offensive standpoint, you know, Lincoln runs a, a, an air raid offense, you know, so it, it is predicated on, you know, attacking, uh, playing fast. Uh, you know, it's, it's an offense that, that certainly has been prolific uh, in the time that he has run it. Um, I think they were, you know, top five in the country in terms of passing offense. And, and certainly, you know, with Caleb Williams running that offense, it was, it was elite. Um, but again, that's what you're looking at, an air raid offense uh, that has its, um, you know, its, its basic premise and, and, you know, obviously pushing the tempo. Um, you know, look, if, if, if they can spread you out and they can get numbers, uh, they're going to run the football as well. Uh, so this is not just throw it all over the place. This is about, you know, if they can get fair numbers and run the football, they'd like to do that too. But it's predicated on an air raid, you know, offense. Um, the recovery center is, is part of putting together in the football operations center um, a high performance center that starts when you walk in with our performance nutrition center. And, and then on the back end of it is the recovery end. And, and you can't be high performance without all of those things. You have to have nutrition. You have to have strength and conditioning. You have to have the ability to, to teach. You have to have the ability uh, to spend time with your players. And then certainly um, the recovery piece, uh, the rehab piece, the diagnostic piece is all there. Everything is, is now in that operations center that allows you to have an elite program. And this is kind of that finishing piece that I, I wanted to present to our media so you saw what a high performance center looks like. Hey Brian, just, is there, oh, I thought I heard something else. Is there anybody uh, on the team who would be unavailable for this game for a non-injury reason? Uh, no, there's there's nobody that um, that has you know, been practicing with us that, um, would not be ex would be excluded for something other than an injury. And then you talked about in the preseason about sort of maybe using two punters, kind of having to come up with a plan there. What is going to be the approach, especially when USC has a returner like Zachariah Branch? Yeah, so uh, you know, I think from a tactical standpoint, y you know, limiting uh, you know his ability to to field the football, right? I mean, we we certainly want to stress um, their returns. Uh, by not kicking it straight down the middle of the field. So, you know, what is that, right? I mean, I think we've got two talented kickers. Uh, I think they both have the ability to impact the game. Um, you know, I think, I think from our standpoint, I, I think we have some things that we can do um, that will allow both of them to impact the game. And it has a lot to do with, you know, trying to keep the ball from – you know, being kicked straight down the middle of the field uh, and giving him uh, an opportunity with space uh, to return kicks. Uh, hey, Coach, right here. Just kind of building off the, the question earlier about the, the offense, just a big part of that will be Miller Moss and kind of his first mm -hmm. year as a starter. I mean, how do you go about approaching that as a, you know, like, I mean, you guys are in that same position having a first-year starter, but just a first-year starter now that's going to get these opportunities. How do you go about planning for a guy like that? Yeah, I'm, I think, you know, he was the MVP of their bowl game, um, and, and, and rightfully so. I thought he played extremely well. Um, and, and so you're really taking a lot of, um, you know, what they did in the bowl game because, you know, you've got a couple of weeks to prepare, right? And they had some time to really kind of settle in on what they felt you know, his comfort level is. Now he's grown from there. He's had a spring practice and he's had, you know, another two and a half weeks. So, you know, there's going to be more to the offense. But, you know, you're going to take what, you know, uh, Coach Riley has been successful with uh, and, and then you're going to look at their offensive structure and, and certainly, you know, begin to, to build your plan accordingly. Um, you know, he does some things a little bit different uh, than, than Caleb. He's not as a freelance player, but, you know, so does Nussmeyer. You know, he's not Jaden Daniels. So I think they, they defend us in a similar fashion where they look at Nussmeyer and what he did in the bowl game, and they kind of attack us the same way. So I think we're both in, you know, kind of a similar space relative to how we build our defensive game plans. Hey, Coach Keller up here. Uh, a lot of unknowns in the opener. We saw that with the game in Ireland this past week, and anything can happen. The comfort level having Garrett at quarterback, does it make 
life a little easier when you walk into to Las Vegas having a guy that you know he's been in this situation before. This isn't a guy that, that can get gun shy and get nervous in these kind of big time games. Yes, I would say that, you know, having a quarterback that has been in the system for the last couple of years that knows um, what it looks like, what what it's like to be in, you know, um, an SEC battle um, is is certainly and has played in a game against a you know pretty darn good defense. Uh, I think that you know those things make you feel a little bit more um, at ease going into these games. But openers are difficult, right? You know, you you practice so much, right? You know, look. You know, spring practice, uh, you know, preseason practice. There's so much practice. And then you got to flip it to performance where, you know, it's your first performance and, and it has you have to execute at a high level in your opener. So um, I think every coach has that uneasiness in the opener uh, because they don't know exactly what, what you're going to get when you flip that script. You hope that, you know, it's flawless execution. Um, you know, we're expecting, you know, much better execution with this group because of the maturity of, of the lot. And, you know, with Garrett, um, you know, he's been in games. He's started games. He's played four quarters. So, again, there's a, a better sense. Um, but, you know, we've got to play a little bit more football. Coach, one of the last times we talked to you, you said the defense was eliminating the egregious bust and they were forcing more turnovers. Uh, how do you feel about your defense going into the season opener, and how much has this new staff improved your players since the spring? Look, this is all about, you know, how do they look against, you know, uh, scripted plays and, you know, limited opportunities. And certainly, you know, I, I know that our football team and, and the guys that we have feel really good about where they're at. But you got to go test yourself, you know, against somebody else to really be able to answer those questions. And, and then we'll be back here in a week and we'll, we'll be able to answer a lot of questions about where we're at. I know going in that we're prepared defensively. Our guys are excited about playing for Blake. Um, I know that they get the scheme very well. There's not a lot of confusion. There's not a lot of busts. There's guys that clearly understand what it is to play LSU football. And... Um, I'm excited to watch them play. And so I think that's half of it, right? Everybody has a high expectation. Um, I expect them to play uh, the level of football on defense that um, we've been accustomed to. And um, they'll get that opportunity on Sunday. Yeah, Brian, as a follow-up to that, specifically your defensive line, I guess from your eyes, what would really constitute a, a very solid performance from them their first time out? A lot of guys first time, and they're playing together. Yeah, do your job. I mean, look, th this isn't this isn't that hard. Uh, you know, if, if we have our guys up front just doing – they're physically strong enough uh, to do their job, and I, I think Bo Davis has done a really good job of just focusing in on the technical – pieces that they need to accomplish and you know if you're a shade play your shade if you're a three play your three let's let's do our job up front I think we're talented at linebacker I think we're talented off the edges I think we're talented that we can get to our spots we just need to do our jobs up front and if we do that and we're one eleventh of our defense with our tackles in particular we're going to be fine and it's just you know trying to do things that are not in, in the scope of what your job description is. Brian. Uh, there's been a lot of focus, obviously, you lose the Heisman Trophy winner and a couple of other first-round draft picks, and it's focused on what you've lost. But, but your, your team returns a lot, not just from last year, but guys who played all the way back in the SEC championship game in mm -hmm. 2022. How has that experience manifested itself th this year, and, and, and how much does that count for in, in college football that – we, we, we focus on the talent and stuff, and, and there's not enough focus on the experience and the chemistry. Well, look, I, I mean, as, as a coach, you know, you always know that that front row is going to leave every year. And so you're always looking at, you know, what's the complexion of this team going to be? Because, you know, winning and losing is such a fine, fine line. And a lot of times... It, it can be just, you know, what the mindset of your team is and, you know, what's the level of accountability and leadership. And I think we have that. I, I think we have 
if if we don't have you know the kind of playmakers maybe that we had last year, we have great leadership. We have guys that have experience. We have guys that hold each other accountable, and they're going to play this game right to the very end. And and I think we've all seen enough college football games that if you just keep playing, and you keep doing your job. Um, you, you know, you can find a way to win games. And I think that that's what this group's about. Um, they've got some experience. They know what it's like to, to, to play and win games. They've won 10 games uh, the last two years in a row and played in an SEC championship. So this is a team that, you know, knows what to do and how to do it. They haven't done it every single week, but they've been pretty darn close. Um, we've had a couple of games where, you know, we didn't bring our best. But... By and large, this group understands what it takes to be successful, and I expect them to, to continue, continue to do that because we have some experience now and we have some, some really good leadership. Here in the middle. To piggyback off of experience and openers, how much can you take away from those two games against Florida State the last two years that you could potentially apply going into this game against USC? You know, I mean, some of the key guys uh, in, in those games are, are no longer here, you know. Um, you know, in, in, in those games, you know, you're, you're getting a quarterback, you know, ready in the first year. You know, um, wide receivers were inexperienced. So, you know, it, you got two freshman tackles. I mean, it, it, it's a journey, right? I mean, I think we're three years into it, and those guys – who played as freshmen are now going to be playing in this opener um, with all that experience. So as, as Scott said, I mean, in one instance, those games that they played against Florida State, um, you know, th they're going to help them in this opener. And, and so, you know, there's a lot of guys that, that have some of those battle scars, you know, from, from previous openers and, and uh, understand what it takes to win an opener uh, on both sides of the ball, you know, whether it's Harold Perkins um, or whether it's Will Campbell. And they both happen to wear number seven, and um, they both were here for that. So, like I said, I, th I think, you know, you, you take away experiences. Um, those guys are leaders for this team. They've been there, done that. That doesn't mean everybody has, but um, they certainly impart and Im impact what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, and, and they're going to impact uh, Sunday in terms of how we, uh, how we play. Hey, Coach, <clears throat> with uh, Hilton and Miles Frazier, if they aren't able to play, um, who would be some guys to keep an eye on this week, um, I guess, on the O-line and then at wide receiver? Yeah, we've been moving that around. Tyree Adams has played a little bit of guard. Paul Mobanga is playing a little bit of guard for us. So, you know, those two guys would be naturally moving in uh, to that position. Um, you know, I, I think that that's kind of how we've been managing it right now. Um, you know, again, Miles should practice here uh, tomorrow for us. Um, so that's why we've got him listed as probable. Uh, Chris will move around uh, today. Uh, with our trainers, we'll get a better sense of his situation. Um, that's why we've got him as questionable because we haven't seen him move around. We've seen Miles move around. Um, Kyle Parker will be the next guy up in, in that situation. He's had a great camp. We feel really good about what he can do for us. And then we can start moving the pieces around a little bit. Um, Xavion Thomas gets a little bit more uh, involved in what we're doing relative to you know, um, playing out at the field. Um, so, you know, we can move some guys around, but those would be the two guys that would be featured a little bit more. Um, Aaron Anderson gets called on a little bit more, and then you can bump, um, you know, Kyron out to, to, to the X as well. So we've got a lot of moving pieces where some guys know multiple positions. Um, but going back to my original um, comments, you, you know, Kyle Parker would be the first guy that, that slides in. Hey, Coach. Um, could, could you just briefly revisit the implications of, of committing to a season opener of this nature in a year when the conferences that both teams are in are getting bigger and stronger and what considerations went into maintaining it on the schedule 
yeah. on both sides and, and whether you might sure. still be inclined to do it again. Sure. Um, well, l let me start with the, the beginning of the question. And none of the, conf the, the conference realignment had not occurred when this agreement had unfolded. And, and then we were so far down the line in terms of getting this done, in terms of, you know, Las Vegas being involved and the financial considerations being involved. And let me, let me end around. This is not about finances. We're not playing this game just because of money. We're playing because you've got two teams that, you know, shared a national championship. You've got two uh, elite programs coming together. And um, that, that's the reason why we wanted the matchup. And, and it was before, you know, the conference had obviously changed, you know, them going into the Big Ten. Um, and, and, and certainly we felt like this was a great matchup. Um, moving forward, um, you know, these may not be the kind of things that you see relative to openers. Um, so, um, again, I, I think we were too far down the line to, to, to want to uh, make any changes with this opener. Uh, I think it's still an appealing opener, even given the changes that have occurred. Um, so I think that that's, that would be my answer, is that we were just too far down the road to make any changes, and that moving forward, we may or may not see something like this. Hey, Coach, right here in the middle. Um, there's a lot of similarities between you guys and USC, and one of them being you guys will be having both have new defense coordinators. Uh, USC hired DeAnton Lynn from UCLA, and last season uh, they were one of the best defenses in the country, first in rush defense and fourth in sacks uh, nationally. Uh, what makes this defense so effective from watching the film? Um, they had some really good players. Um, their defensive end, uh, you know, was a first-round draft pick. Um, you know, they had some... Uh, you know, I think, again, very active, um, play a lot of man coverage, a very similar scheme in terms of, you know, getting after people. Um, and, and so I, I just think a very aggressive, um, uh, you know, defensively, you know, there's, there, there's different ways, right, to attack people. And uh, I think Coach Lynn did a great job of, of looking at matchups, um, utilizing his personnel in a great way at UCLA. And he's probably going to do the same thing here with, with the new personnel that he has. And so, um, you know, we've evaluated what he's done at UCLA. He's got a new staff as well. Who knows what kind of influences the new staff? You know, he's got, he's got some outstanding staff members uh, that they've assembled, defensive line, linebackers, uh, secondary. So um, we just have to be prepared, you know, um, you know, to handle, you know, three down, four down, pressures, all of those things, and, and be who we are. Uh, but know that uh, we have a great deal of respect for what he's done. Coach, right here, uh, players on both sides of the ball during fall camp talked about stacking good days, and the coordinators did as well. How does that translate into a game week and how you want to see that happen? And then, obviously, what's your hope for how that comes to fruition on Sunday night and each game day? Yeah, I, I think any – any good program, any great program that aspires to be great, you know, has to have a model of consistency. I mean, it's, you know, I don't know that any of us have a job where they, you know, our boss tells us, hey, it's okay to be really good at what you do on Tuesday and Thursday. But don't worry about Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know. It's just, you know, I, I think we all kind of live in the same world of, you know, this, this has to be something that, is the constant application of what you do. And, and it's, you know, it's hard. It's hard to do that, you know, with 18 to 21 year olds. And getting that constant application is what you're asking for with 72 plays, right? You know, you can't take a play off. You know, you can't have, you know, a mistake where you, you know, you're supposed to be playing this coverage and you're playing another. And, and, and that just requires a focus, a consistency, great habits, and, and so that's why when we say stacking days together, we're, we're hoping to build elite habits with, with our football players. And, you know, we try to do it in other areas of their life so that when it comes to football, um, it feels easy. Brian, this is playing USC is obviously new for LSU. It's not new for you. You did it for a long time at Notre Dame. Uh, 
a couple of prongs to the question. Is there any similarities with this SC team to the ones you faced? Does preparing for them for as long as you did help you at all here? And then maybe just a thought on what it's like to, to go into a game against, against SC when you're playing that name and that brand. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of history and tradition, you know. I mean, playing in the Coliseum, I think, really kind of brings it more to um, light, right? You know, you get the white horse running and, you know, they're in the Trojan band is playing and it's the Coliseum. And, you know, that pageantry is, is really, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the fabric of college football, much like, you know, Death Valley. Um, or, or any of the other great venues, um, you know. The, you know the the two thousand and you know nineteen twenty twenty one version of of USC was built on the air raid as well. So, you know, this there's some similarities. Um, you know, from that perspective, you know, Lincoln Riley is a is a great play caller. So. You know, I'm not here to argue who, who's a better play caller, but there were similarities in terms of what they were trying to do offensively. So that's why the transition in terms of, you know, what they went to offensively was, was pretty seamless. So um, pretty similar there, but, you know, you're going to get outstanding skill players on the field. You're going to get uh, players that um, on both sides of the ball um, – to your naked eye, you know, you're going to go, that that looks like an SEC player. And that looks like a guy that would be playing in the SEC. And, and that's what we'll get on Sunday. Hey, Coach. Um, so in terms of defense, and more specifically, Jacoby and Guillory, what kind of year are you anticipating for him to have? And then, like, what are you looking forward to most in him? Well, he's he's been our best defensive tackle, uh, our most consistent um, starting with the tail end of last year uh, and and that continued through the spring and into preseason camp um, he's he's extremely strong physically strong can hold the point plays with great leverage um, and, and technique uh, he's really come along uh, incredibly well in terms of the ability to use his hands and disengage and find the football. There's one thing to have strength, you know, at the point of the tack, but if you can't find the football, nah, okay, you just hold the point. What he's been able to do is use great strength, and now he's controlling the blocker and finding the football. What do I think we'll see? He's going to make a lot of tackles. and and. Defensive tackles, if you look at their sheets at the end of the day in terms of assisted tackles, even unassisted tackles, you know, sometimes they show up with maybe two, three. That's a big day. You know, he's going to be a guy that's going to be involved in the tackle sheet, and, and that's, that's saying a lot for a defensive tackle. 